What a great reminder. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Um, it's not every day that we hear those hymns anymore. Um, and I ask if you would to take something with me to the Lord in prayer. I did something on Friday uh, that I've been dreading for a while. Uh, my son Evan is 15 years old, and I remember the day that he was born. I remember standing there in the hospital where this had this bright light shining on him, and he was crying. I remember all of those things about him. I remember uh, coming home with him on a Saturday and carrying him around like a football while we watched a Clemson football game. And I remember so many different things that he's gone through in his life, but this Friday was one that... Um, I was glad to be a part of it, but I'm not really sure. We had the privilege. He's 15 years old, and so we took our trip to the DMV, and he took his driver's test, or his, um, the, the permit test. And as we, he was, we, we got all the paperwork filled out, and he walked into the room where you're supposed to go take your test. And just before he walked in, he looked back at me, and I just gave him a thumbs up, like, you got this. This is something, you, you got this. And then sure enough, as he proceeded to take the test, he came out and he gave me the thumbs up that we did it. And so take it to the Lord in prayer. I ask if you would to be praying for me as a dad as we venture through this teaching him how to drive and uh, all the fun that goes with that. But that reminds me of, not reminds me, it, it, it leads me to um, where we are today in our passage in 2 Thessalonians. Um, you know, been going through this over the last couple of weeks on Sunday nights, and Pastor Brian left off in the middle of chapter 2, and I'm going to pick up right where he left off. In fact, I'm going to cover a little bit of chapter 10 just as well as he did uh, last week. But just to understand, Paul is in this section in, Second Th- in, Ch- in, in 1 Thessalonians in chapter 2, this specific part of this letter, Paul is writing this to encourage the church. Um, just like Evan needed that one little vote of confidence, like, hey, you got this. Paul is writing this letter to encourage the church at Thessalonica because there are some things that have been happening. Paul um, and uh, Timothy and Sylvanus, they were at Thessalonica, and Paul they ran off. And since they've gone, since they've left, there have been some other people that have come in. The Jewish leaders in that community have tried to um, reestablish what they had already maintained, what they already had, and they tried. They're trying to discredit Paul. Uh, they spent some time talking, evidently they spent some time talking about Paul maybe being in the ministry there to make money. And Paul spent some time in this letter where we pick up today talking about his integrity, talking about some of those things. And then he'll eventually get to the point where he gives a thumbs up to this early church to help them understand, you've got this, you're on the right track, we're going to continue going. So if you would, turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm going to begin reading in verse Uh, Verse number 9, actually. For you were called, brethren, our labor and hardship, how working night and day is not to be a burden on any of you. We proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and so is God, how devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behaved towards you believers. Just as you know how we are exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as a father would his own children. So that you would walk in a manner worthy of, uh, of the God who calls you into his own ki- uh, kingdom and glory. For this reason, we also constantly thank God for when you received the word of God, which you heard from this from us, you accepted it, not as a word from men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus, that are in Judea, and you also endured the same sufferings at the hands of your own countrymen, even as they did from the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets, and drove us out. They are not pleasing to God, but hostile to all men, hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles, so that they may be saved, with the result that they always fill up the measure of their sins. But wrath has come upon them to the utmost." Pastor Brian last week um, started in chapter 2, and as I said, we're going we're gonna to pick up at right as pa- where Pastor Brian left off. Uh, yet last week he talked about them being a, about Paul, how, the, how he was a faithful steward and how he was a loving parent. When he gets to a loving parent, he talked about the patience that they had, the passion that he had, and the persistence that Paul had in leading and teaching and trying to help this young church grow. And he's offering this as a reminder, because remember, Paul isn't there. He's no longer with them. He's writing this as a letter to remind them of these things. 
And one of the things that obviously has happened is the, the, the Jewish community in that area, they're questioning Paul's, uh, his, his, his intentions while he's there. Um, one of the questions that most people believe that this question is Paul's, uh, the reason in being in the ministry. They thought he was there to make a living off of the ministry. But one of the things, if you study through the book of Acts, you realize that in Thessalonica, Paul was there long enough to establish and to get a job, to, to develop his, his, his own livelihood. He wasn't there making money off of the church. He was there in his tent making, and that was one of the things that he established in the amount of time that they were there. And so Paul, the first thing that I'll pick up after Pastor Brian left off in verse number 10, he says, you're my witnesses, and so is God, how devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behaved towards you believers. The first thing that Paul is reminding them here is of his integrity. Paul wants them to understand that, listen, I'm not, those things that they're accusing us of, those aren't things that we're doing. We are men of integrity. What we did, we came there to honor God and to grow his church. And it's interesting that Paul says, he mentions that the church at Thessalonica, he says, you are my witnesses, but not only are you my witnesses, he says, so is God. And that's one of the things that we need to always keep in the forefront of what we're thinking, that when we're trying to maintain our integrity, that God is always watching. It's not just about the people who are around us. Our integrity is who we are when no one is watching, when no one is there. And if we can understand that, uh, it will help us in our life. He says, how devoutly, how uprightly, how blamelessly we behave towards you believers. Paul's talking about these actions, these adverbs that describe their behavior. These, he's, he's not just saying our, the way that we behave towards you, but he's specifically saying how devout we were to you, how uprightly we walked, and how blameless we were in our walk. And that blamelessly is really where we get to his integrity. My life verse is Proverbs chapter 20, verse 7. The verse says that the righteous man walks in his integrity and his children are blessed after him. And talking about Evan and, and that, talking about you know, my daughter watching Kaylin play this piano, um, I can't think of a parent in this room who doesn't have a desire for their children to be blessed. Well, when we look at Proverbs, we look at that, the intent there is that the righteous man walks in his integrity and then his children are blessed after him. So what we see is that for our children to be blessed, the greatest blessing that our children can have from us as parents, from us as individuals, from us as a church, and really what we see from Paul here is that we be men and women of integrity. And Paul wants the church to understand that he was always about maintaining his integrity. One of the things he set out to do every day after we see his integrity, the next thing that we'll look at is the guidance that he offered. In verse 11 it says, Just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as a father would his own children. Last week, Pastor Brian talked about the mother and the, the nurturing that the mother does. Here, Paul, he, he opens up with the mother, and then he closes up this, this section by talking about the father. And he talks about this difference that uh, he, he offers uh, what, we, what we see from a mother, this nurturing mother, this nurture that the mother offers to her children. Well, the father offers something a little bit different than the mother should offer. The father o offers this exhortation. Um, that word is parakaleo. It means to urge, and not just to urge, but to urge someone to the point of action. That we encourage our children, that we encourage the people who are invested. Paul is reminding the church here that he's encouraged them to the point of action. It's not just enough for Paul, for Paul to say, I want you to do this, now just do whatever you want. Paul's purpose in his exhortation is to help the church at Thessalonica understand that our, this, this, this urging for Paul should lead our actions to be different. And as we see that in our Christian life, that's what it's all about, is living different, living the way that God would have us to. That word encouraging, it means to give emotional support or to strength to one who is in distress, times of distress, when we need that encouragement. Many of you, just like me, uh, the Christian life is a tough life to live. It's a difficult life to live. And there are many times that we need that source of encouragement. We need those people to come alongside us, and uh, just as Moses had Aaron and her to hold up his arms so the Israelites could We need those people to come alongside and to encourage us, to help us to grow, to challenge us, to be there for us. And that's what we see there with Paul, as Paul is encouraging those believers to do these things. And then that last word is imploring. And the word there it means to testify. And it just it, it means that we're testifying in especially important matters. Things that really and truly matter and make an impact in this world. And Paul says that as a leader, as the leader of the church, just as you know, we exhorted you, we encouraged you, and we implored you 
to, to testify to those things which really matter. As a Christian, the most important thing to which we can testify is the gospel. The most important thing that I could ever share with anyone is the gospel. A lot of you guys, maybe you probably, I'm sure there's probably at least one gentleman in this room who, while he's here, has got his eye on his phone checking the score of the basketball game. All right? I'm not judging you for doing that. I'm just saying there's probably somebody that's doing that. Well, we, 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 we spend so much time talking about sports. We spend so much time talking about, you know, if we go to a new restaurant, we'll tell everybody and their brother about this restaurant that, which we, that we've just gone to, how good the food is, how much we really enjoy it. But how often do we share our faith? How often do we tell others about this relationship with God that we supposedly have? The, the estimate is that 95% of Christians never share their faith. 95% of Christians never will share their faith. Now, when I say share their faith, we'll invite people to come to church. We'll invite them to come to maybe the sportsman's banquet. We'll invite them to come, maybe children. We'll invite them to come to vacation Bible school. For our students, we'll invite them to come to camp. We'll invite them to come to Disciple Now weekend. But only 5% of Christians will ever specifically sit down with someone and share their faith. And Paul says here that Paul encouraged them to implore them, to show them how to do these things, to testify to these things which are most important. And he taught them these things just like a father is supposed to teach his son or his children. And so we see in this of what Paul does, we see how Paul takes this opportunity um, to, to look at a mom and a dad. And he compares the relationship of a mother to her children and how she nurtures, how she's gentle, how she encourages the way that a mom is supposed to treat her children, how she has that tender love. And at the same time, he says, I also encouraged you, exhorted you, implored you, like a father does his children, to instruct them to do something with their life, to do something different, to testify to these things that God had given them the ability to testify to. We see his purpose. The next thing we see there, verse 12, Paul writes this, So you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So Paul's integrity, his guidance, and there, verse 12, we see his purpose. His purpose is, 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 is one thing, that they would walk in a manner worthy of God, that they would walk in such a way that God would see that walk and it would bring glory to him. I believe that our ultimate purpose in life is to bring glory to God and then to help others bring glory to God also. Now, bringing glory to God looks different for every single one of us, but ultimately in our lives, our life's purpose should be to bring glory to God. And this is what Paul wants them to understand. In this letter of encouragement to them, this letter as people are questioning Paul's integrity, questioning Paul's reason for being there, questioning the, the, the efforts behind this church plant at Thessalonica, Paul wants this church to understand that there is a purpose for every single thing that we do. Verses 9 through 12, we see where Paul reminds the church that he acted as a nurturing mother and a teaching father, a mother who has a soft touch, and a gentle patience to tenderly care for her, for her children. He then transitions to a father offering instruction to his children, instruction to lead and guide them to become mature believers. And as we see this, this ultimately brings us back to, like I said, our life purpose. My life purpose, our life purpose, is to bring glory to God. How are we doing that? How in our world, in our culture, in 2019, how do we bring glory to God? As I said a minute ago, it's different for you. It may be different for me. The look of how we bring glory to God. But regardless of the look, our goal in life should be to bring glory to God. And so as we, as we see that, that kind of concludes that passage, that section there which, where Paul is, he, he's reminding them that he's a loving parent, trying to educate them, trying to, to nurture them, trying to help them to grow in the purpose of the church. The next thing that we see Paul teaches them, or what we see of Paul, is that he is also a thankful leader. Paul opens up in chapter 1, verse 2, and he, he talks about how thankful he was for them. One of the things we see often in Paul's letters is his thankfulness to the churches at the church of Philippi in, in, in Philippians chapter 1, verse 3. He says, I thank my God for every remembrance of you. Paul was a thankful man. 
And the reason that Paul was thankful was because I, I personally believe that Paul remembers from where he was saved. Paul remembers what his life was like before Christ and then what his life is like now and how he's trying to encourage other people to do these things. And so Paul in Philippians, he offers that word of, thanks, that, that word of thankfulness. Here in 1 Thessalonians, he offers it there. And then he offers it again in verse 13. He says, for this reason, we also constantly thank God. It's not just an, an every once in a while thankfulness. It's not just like a lot of times families when we pray. Um, if I were to ask this question, how many of you prayed before your, your lunch today? Most of us may raise our hand. But how often do we pray other than before meals? How often do we sit down with our families and spend time in prayer? Paul here, and as, we, as we're praying, we're thankful for the things that God has done for us. Paul here says that for this reason... Because of all of these things that we've seen before this, we also constantly thank God. That when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. Paul there, he talks about this constant thanking God for all that the church at, at, at Thessalonica meant to him. And then the reason that he has this thankfulness, there's, there's three reasons ultimately that we see this thankfulness. The first is we see that they imitated the church. I'm sorry, they, re they received the word of God. Um, they, their, their reception of the word of God. He's grateful that they received this. Uh, he's grateful that they said, we'll take this word and we'll try to Im implement these words into our life instead of rejecting the word. Which is where we come to in our culture today. To reject Jesus means to reject the word. To reject the word means to reject Jesus. And Paul is, is grateful. He's thankful for this church because they, they, they received the word of God. They, they received the Bible. They received the scriptures. And they said, this is something that's going to be important to us. We're going to make it an effort to spend time in the word. Paul sees this. He sees the successes that they have. And the reason they have the success, first of all, is because of their acceptance of the word. When we get there, uh, the, the, the word that the, at, the, at the end of that phrase, there's the, the phrase in the New American Standard says it performs its work. That word in the Greek is energeo. It's the same root word from where we get our word energy. Okay? And so what Paul, is, what Paul is saying here is that we use this, that this Bible, ultimately that this Bible is what brings us this energy to go on with your Christian life. The Bible is what represents this for us. And Paul is grateful he's, that they received the word of God. Not only is he grateful they received the word of God, he, he's also grateful that they imitated the church of God. Verse 14a says, For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. They imitated the churches of God. They modeled their lives after the churches that they had seen. The churches that Paul had planted, the churches that Paul had worked with, and they became imitators of those churches. They practiced the same things those churches practiced. They did the same things those churches did. They may have sang the same songs. They read the same Bible. They did all of those things that we see the early church do. They imitated those things. One of the things that you always see, I, I always get tickled. Um, uh, I've heard this before of myself, that I act a lot like my dad. How many men in the room act a lot like your dad? Wives, don't nudge them, all right? But we imitate those, and sometimes we imitate people, and we don't even realize that we do. We imitate those guys. We, we follow after them. We live those lives because we've seen that modeled so much before us. And that's something that Paul is saying here, that they imitated, and he's grateful that they imitated the church of God. Because he's, in just a minute, we're going to see why he's grateful that they imitated the church of God. Uh, after that, we see in, in part B, we see that they perceived in suffering. He's grateful that they were successful in per persevering in suffering. He says, For you also endured the same sufferings at the hand of your own countrymen, even as they did from the Jews. There's this persecution that was going on that constantly was faced, the early church constantly faced. And it's very similar persecutions to which we face today. Any of us that are Christians and we actively are living our faith, we will face some form of persecution. If your faith hasn't cost you anything at this point in time in your life, you may not own that faith. Our faith should cost us something. There should be some type of perseverance that we have to have. Because I say I'm a Christian, 
Because I say that I love God, I should be so different than the world that I should suffer something. You look across the world and you see story after story after story of individuals, of, of, of pastors, of Christians, of, of missionaries who suffer because of their faith in Christ. Because of their faith of what God has done for them. But in spite of their suffering, in spite of all of their hurt, they're willing to constantly go on. Um, there's uh, uh, an individual that I've heard speak before. His name is uh, Clayton King. Um, some, of our, some of our staff, um, really good friends with, with, with Clayton. Clayton is the, the pastor at Elevation, not Elevation, at New Spring Church up in Anderson. And uh, we had the privilege of going to hear him a couple of weeks ago. Uh, back about six years ago, Clayton was telling a story about uh, a, a, a pastor and the pastor was in, in, in another country, and uh, the pastor had a young daughter and had a wife. And this was a, an underdeveloped country where Christianity was heavily, heavily persecuted. And as Clayton, the, the pastor, tells Clayton this story that men came to their church and told the pastor that if you continue preaching you know, this Bible that you preach, um, we're going to shut down the church, he continued to preach. They came back and told him the same thing. If you continue to preach this Bible, we're going to shut you down. Finally, they come and they say, listen, if you continue to preach this, we're going to arrest you. He says, you're going to have to arrest me. And um, I'm going to give you the PG version of the story. They come back the next time and they tell the pastor, if you continue to preach, we're going to arrest you. We're going to arrest your wife and we're going to arrest your young daughter. He continues preaching and they do just that. They arrest both the pastor, his wife, and his daughter. The wife and the daughter, um, we'll just say that they're abused, and they're abused in front of this husband. And this husband, as the wife and the daughter are abused, the men who are abusing these ladies tell this pastor that if you'll stop preaching and you'll renounce this Jesus that you teach about, we'll let them go. And the pastor says that his daughter looked him dead in the eye and said, Daddy, don't do it. Don't you stop. Now, that's persecution that I have never experienced, and I pray that I never do. But the reality is that's persecution that Christians face around the world every single day. The early church here at Thessalonica, they, they experienced some of that same persecution. But in spite of that persecution, they persevered. They were able to hold on. They were able to, 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 to maintain their faith. And because they're able to maintain their faith, Paul was... Uh, he was thankful for them, and he considered them to be a successful church. Now, we're going to look at that successful church plant, and we're going to compare that to the Jews, and we're going to see where there's contrast here. If we look at verse number 15, we see this failure. We see the Jews' rejection of God. Paul writes this, Even as they did from the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. So Paul's not only talking about this rejection of the Jews for Jesus and for the prophets because it was ultimately the Jews that killed Jesus. It was ultimately the Jews that killed some of the prophets in the Old Testament that we see that, that, that died. But he also says these are the people that drove us out. Remember, Paul had established a, a business there in Thessalonica. And his, this plan, we don't know how long he necessarily planned to stay there, but this group of Jews drove Paul and these guys out of Dodge. And made them leave. And so Paul says that these, these Jews, they're failures because they rejected, they're re, because of their rejection of God. In verse 16, we see the Jews' hindrance of the church. Not only did they reject God, but they also hindered the church. They also caused the church to stop growing. Paul writes this. He says that they were hostile to all men, hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they might be saved. Paul's frustration with the Jews was not only that they rejected God, but they also prohibited Paul from being able to share his faith with everyone that he wanted to. Remember, Paul, the greatest missionary to ever live, had this goal to bring glory to God, and his way of bringing glory to God was to bring people along with him, to allow people to become Christian with him based on his word and on his life. But this early church, or the, the early Jew, the Jews here at Thessalonica, they were this hindrance to the church. They prohibited the church from being able to grow. The end of verse 16, we see the Jewish punishment in suffering. 
Whereas the early church persevered in suffering, the Jews are suffering punishment because of the suffering. When the, with the result that they always fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them to the utmost. What that literally says there is they always heap up their sins to the limit. They always just continue to pile up sin, pile up sin, pile up sin, pile up sin, until it's so full that they're done. That it, it, it's basically, it would be the basic, basically the same thing as taking the New England Patriots and saying that the New England Patriots are going to play a high school football team. Now, if we look at that and we know anything about football, we don't really have to know much about football, but we know that the New England Patriots are a professional football team that's won however many Super Bowls they've won. If they were to play a high school football team, the likelihood of that foot, high school football team winning is slim to none. You would I may even, even go to the point of saying, well, this, we'll just go ahead and write this off as a win for the Patriots. And when we see this, this is, the, this is in essence what Paul is writing, that because they always fill up the measure of their sins, they always heap up their sins to their limit, the wrath has come upon, come upon them to the utmost. So the wrath... Even though they're compiling up these sins, they're building up these sins, they're building them up, building them up, building them up. Paul says, at some point in time, payday's coming. At some point in time, this group of people, they're going to suffer because of these things that they've done. Because of the way that they've treated the church. Because of their sin, they're going to suffer. And so Paul concludes this part of this letter by being encouraged by the church. And he's telling the church, listen, I'm so grateful for what you've done. You've succeeded. The Jews, they fail, but you've succeeded. You, you're doing what God's calling you to do. There's a young man um, that I had the privilege of performing he and his wife's wedding uh, about three years ago. Uh, they're actually pregnant. They're expecting their firstborn um, son here in a couple of months. And um, this man was, uh, he was, his family, they go to the church, I was on staff before coming uh, to Second Baptist. And at that church, we did our student small groups on Monday nights. And um, there at that church, um, at this point in time, we did our small groups down in the basement of the church. And one night, I was at church, the church was already open and everything was going on. And I leave my office to walk downstairs. And we had just finished going through a series, about a two-month series on servanthood. How can we be better servants of God? How can we be better servants of the church? And how can we be better servants of our community? We had just gone through about a two-month series on servanthood and what that really looks like. Well, that night, it's, um, it's in the winter, you know, so it's a little bit darker, you know, early. So it's, I guess it's about 6. We start at 6, and so it's about 5.45. And I walk downstairs, and I see the lights are already on downstairs in the basement of this church. And I walk in the classroom where we're going to meet, and I walk in to see... This student, his name is Eric. I see Eric standing up on a table on, in, in, in this classroom. And for you know, most of you that know anything about student ministry, it's not uncommon to see students standing on tables, but we always fuss at them and say, hey, get off of that table because you're going to break it, or all of these different crazy things that happen with, in student ministry. Well, I walked in, and I saw Eric standing up on this table. I said, get off of that table. What are you doing? What's going on? And it kind of got on him, and I didn't pay attention to what he was actually doing. He was actually changing the light bulb in the classroom, one of those fluorescent lights. And he said, well, uh, Eric, what, what, what are you doing? Why are you standing on this table? And he said, well, this light bulb was burnt out, and I had just finished changing the light bulb. And I said, well, why would you even think to do that? And he said, well, Brandon, I saw that it was out. I knew where the replacement bulbs were, and you just finished talking about serving. So I figured, what better way to serve Jesus than by changing the light bulb if the light bulb needed to be changed? I'm like, well, okay, I guess, thank you. Uh, and... But in that time, in that moment, this, as, I, as, I, as I study through this, it reminds me of that moment whenever he was successful. He had a moment in which he saw a need, as big or as small as, 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 as what, whatever the need was. He, he realized he noticed this need, and in noticing this need, he knew how to address it, and he took care of it. Paul is taking this time to encourage this church to say, keep doing the things that you're good at. 
Keep doing those things. Keep serving people. Keep loving people. Keep your focus on the Word of God. Keep all of these things in focus. He's taking this opportunity to write this letter, one, to say, listen, I'm a man of integrity. I am who I say I am, but you need to continue doing the things that you're doing. Don't worry about those Jews. You keep your laser-like focus on what God's called us to do. And for us at Second Baptist Church, this is my encouragement to us, not me, not to you, but to us, that we continue seeking after God, just like Paul said. Keep seeking after Him. Keep loving Him. Keep finding time. Keep speak, spending time in His Word. And as you continue spending time in His Word, continue doing those things that He has called you to. Persevere when suffering comes, because it's going to come. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when suffering comes. Paul says, keep on keeping on. Don't worry about all those other distractions. Keep on keeping on. Church, let's keep on keeping on. Let's keep on doing those things that God has called us to do. Let's keep being Second Baptist Church, the church that loves God, that loves people, and that lives the mission.